Good evening and welcome. Tonight I'm going to be reading to you from this book about Uganda. Let me show you what we're going to read tonight. We're going to read this closer look at Uganda section so we can learn more about Ugandan culture. We're going to read Birds of Uganda, A Country of Great Lakes, Folklore of the Buganda, Gorillas and Other Primates, HIV AIDS in Uganda, The Holy Spirit Movement, Kampala, the Capital City, The Martyrs of Uganda, Mountains of the Moon, Namilyango College, National Parks and Wildlife, The Rise and Fall of Idi Amin, Same Lula Klenzi Kakungulu, The Women of Uganda, and A Wondrous House, The Kiss and Giri Home. So let's just dive right in. I've got pencil here marking the spot. Put that away. And let's start off with the birds of Uganda. Diverse landscapes, diverse bird life. The bird life in Uganda is remarkably rich, with more than 1,000 species known to inhabit the country. Uganda's geographical location on the African continent and also its diverse landscapes, which include low and highland forests, swamps and wetlands, savannas, and arid desert-like regions, are the main reasons the country can support such a diverse population of birds. Ornithologists and birdwatching enthusiasts are impressed by the variety of different species and subspecies that have been identified in Uganda and believe that many more have yet to be seen as of the beginning of the 21st century. The rare shoebill stork. Right there, it's a wacky guy. Nicknamed the whale-headed stork by some, the shoebill stork is actually more similar to the pelican species. Shoebill storks live in swamps and wetlands, and in Uganda they can be seen in the Murchison Falls National Park and also the Queen Elizabeth National Park. In fact, Uganda is reputed to be the country of the world in which the elusive shoebill stork is most frequently seen. The shoebill stork's favorite food is the lungfish, which is a type of hardy eel-like fish. In Africa, lungfish can sometimes grow to six feet long. Uganda's National Bird Popularly known as the gray-crowned or gray-crested crane, Uganda's national bird is a magnificent sight. Colorful and statuesque, gray-crowned cranes tend to live in marshes or wetlands at higher altitudes. Because they often travel in large flocks, gray-crowned cranes cause quite a stir when they take off from more land in a particular spot. More frequently, however, cranes of this species interact in pairs. They have been spotted bowing and bobbing their heads at each other, as well as performing vigorous movements resembling a dance. Some experts regard gray-crowned cranes and black-crowned cranes as subspecies of the larger crowned crane family, while other experts treat gray-crowned cranes as a separate species. Next is the country of Great Lakes. It's a very wobbly book. <laughs> Uganda's one of six countries that make up the Great Lakes region in eastern Africa. The other countries are the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or the DRC, Kenya, and Tanzania, as well as the relatively tiny nations of Burundi and Rwanda. Lake Albert. Located along the western border of Uganda, Lake Albert is long and narrow in shape. About half of its length falls in Ugandan territory, the other half belongs to the DRC. The lake holds some 67 cubic miles of water in an area measuring about 2,046 square miles. Lake Albert has an average depth of 82 feet, and the deepest part of the lake measures 190 feet. Lake Edward Lake Edward is well known for having remarkably clear waters. Visitors have reported being able to see hippopotamuses while they are submerged in the water. Located in southwestern Uganda, 
Lake Edward is also split between Uganda and the DRC, but the DRC has a slightly larger share of the lake. Lake Edward has a surface area of about 897 square miles, the maximum depth of 367 feet. The Ugandan part has an average depth of 56 feet. And the massive Lake Victoria. Although Lake Victoria is officially shared by Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya, Kenya's territory at the lake's northeastern tip is relatively small. About half of Lake Victoria lies within Uganda's southeastern borders. Lake Victoria is not only the world's largest tropical lake, but also the world's second largest freshwater lake after Lake Superior in the United States. Living up to its reputation, Lake Victoria covers an area of about 26,557 square miles and contains an estimated 660 cubic miles of water. The lake has an average depth of 130 feet, and the deepest part of the lake is about 276 feet below the surface. Lake Victoria is so vast that, and that a handful of islands are located within the lake. The Sesi Islands are some of the larger islands. The lake's shoreline is a staggering 2,138 miles long. Check it out. Folklore of the Baganda Storytime Baganda literature is rich in proverbs, riddles, and legends. This body of oral literature helps the Baganda remember and celebrate the history, culture, values, and folklore of Baganda. Legend of Kintu, the first man on earth. One of the most important stories of the Baganda is the legend of Kintu, the first man on earth. One version of the story tells of how Kintu wanted to marry Nambi, but needed the permission of Nambi's father, Gulu, who lived in heaven. Gulu did not approve of Kintu because Kintu did not plant crops for food, but depended on cattle instead. To determine if Kintu was good enough to marry his daughter, Gulu sent Kintu a test. Kintu was to pick out his own cow from a large herd. Kintu was anxious because the cows all looked alike. A bee soon flew by and whispered into Kintu's ear that he would land on the horns of Kintu's cow. With the bee's help, Kintu correctly identified his cow and won Gulu's approval to marry Nambi. Gulu then advised the couple to hurry back to Earth and not to return for any reason, because Walumbe, who represented death, was hanging around and would follow them back if he saw them. Kintu and Nambi listened and hurried away, bringing with them some cows, a goat, a chicken, a sheep, and a plantain tree. Nambi, however, forgot the grain to feed her chicken, and she went back to get it. Walumbe saw her and followed her back to Earth. Once on Earth, Walumbe began to spread illness and death everywhere. Death continues to stalk the Earth to this day. This story explains how the Baganda see their history and also tells of the origins of cows and crops, which are important to daily life. The legend teaches that disobedience to parents or the king results in unhappiness and death. Obedience is an extremely important virtue for the Baganda. The character of the bee in the legend of Kintu has spawned many folktales about animals. These folktales also explain important moral themes. Many of the animal folktales involve animal pairs, such as the leopard and the hare, the cat and the fowl, or the lion and the crocodile. Let's see, we have King Mtipi the second, or Kabaka. This book is so... <laughs> I cannot... If I try to push this down, this flops. If I try to push this down, that flops. It's a very wobbly book. I'm trying my best to, like, reel it in. Let's read about gorillas and other primates. Uganda is home to more than 10 species of primates, including the endangered mountain gorilla, the common chimpanzee, and various types of monkeys, such as the red and black and white colobus monkeys. The mountain gorilla, check them out. The mountain gorilla 
is an endangered species. In 1987, the situation was critical when less than 250 mountain, with less than 250 mountain gorillas in the world. Today, the population has risen to between 600 and 620, and the gorillas are about equally divided between the highland forests about 25 miles north of the Bwindi Impenetrable National Park in southwestern Uganda and the Virunga Mountains, which lie farther south and spread over Uganda, Rwanda, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. A really good photo. We'll have a book about the gorillas for you tomorrow. It won't be as floppy. My goodness, let me... Okay, <laughs> hold it down. I can read you more about gorillas. The mountain gorilla shares 98% of the human genome, which means that the mountain gorilla is a very close relative of the human species. Male mountain gorillas are generally taller than females, which usually measure about five feet tall and are twice as heavy. Gentle and shy mountain gorillas do not adapt well to life in captivity and are mainly folivorous or leaf eating. The common chimpanzee. The common chimpanzee divides into three main subspecies, and the eastern common chimpanzee is the most common in East Africa. The other two subspecies are the central common chimpanzee and the western common chimpanzee. The Kibale National Park in western Uganda is home to an extraordinarily diverse community of primates, which include chimpanzees and different monkeys, such as the red tail monkey, the red colobus monkey, the black and white colobus monkey, and the gray-cheeked mangabe. Never heard of that one. Both the eastern common chimpanzee and the gray-cheeked mangabe are omnivorous, or eat a combination of plants and animals, while both the red and the black and white colobus monkeys are folivorous. The red tail monkey is frugivorous, or eats mainly fruits. Learning so many vocab words today. HIV AIDS in Uganda. Uganda identified its first case of AIDS in 1982. Ten years later, some areas of Uganda reported an AIDS prevalence rate of as high as 30%. This meant that 30% of the Ugandans aged between 15 and 49 in these areas were living with the HIV virus or AIDS. By the end of 2001, however, the overall prevalence for the country had fallen to about 6.5%. The reduction in the rate of Ugandans becoming infected with HIV each year has been hailed worldwide as a successful attempt at combating the disease. Despite these successes, Uganda had lost close to one million of its citizens to the disease by the end of 2001. These deaths have also made Uganda the country with the highest proportion of children orphaned by HIV-AIDS. In 2001, it was estimated that there were 1,050,555 Ugandans living with HIV-AIDS, a figure that includes about 105,000 Ugandan children aged below 15 years old. Let me get about it in school. The Impact of HIV-AIDS on Society HIV-AIDS has had a devastating effect on Ugandan society. The spread of HIV-AIDS was a serious problem in Uganda in the early 1980s. Many families suffered not only because one of their family members had contracted the disease, but also because they were unable to obtain medical attention or medicines. HIV and AIDS have reduced economic growth and incomes and increased poverty. The majority of Ugandans living with HIV-AIDS are between the ages of 15 and 49, the time in their lives when people are usually most economically active. Illnesses linked to HIV-AIDS, however, prevent many of them from working and supporting their families and communities. Homes in which one or more family members are infected with HIV-AIDS are poor because they spend a lot of money on medication for the sick family members. Children of HIV-AIDS affected parents often stop going to school in order to look after their parents. HIV-AIDS thus also reduces access to education. 
government support. Uganda's success at combating HIV-AIDS infections is due to the strong government commitment to fighting the disease at all levels and in all areas of life. As early as 1987, the government decided to tackle the crisis. In 1992, Uganda's parliament adopted the multi-sectoral approach to the control of AIDS, or MACA. In addition, the government also set up the Uganda AIDS Commission. This commission is the main Ugandan body that coordinates the efforts of various sectors of Ugandan society to ensure that both individuals and community and political groups work together to combat HIV-AIDS. Uganda's president, Yoweri Museveni, himself has given public support to the work of the Uganda AIDS Commission. Next we have the Holy Spirit Movement. The Holy Spirit Movement developed at a time when lawlessness and violent civil fighting had been part of everyday Ugandan life for nearly 20 years. Ethnic tensions had intensified during this time because of relentless power struggles between military strongmen and rebel leaders belonging to different ethnic groups. After Yoweri Museveni led the National Resistance Army, or NRA, to victory in 1986, Alice Auma, a member of the Acholi ethnic group that traditionally dominated northern Uganda, responded by forming a resistance rebel group that became the Holy Spirit Movement. Believing that the Museveni government had intentions to dissolve Acholi territory and traditions, she sought to spread and encourage anti museveni sentiments. Lakwena, the messenger of God. Alice Auma claimed to be a messenger of God and that God had ordered her to fight evil, which included the Museveni government. Her views combined elements of Christianity, some animistic practices, and ethnic and political loyalties, and her formula for persuasion proved to be powerful. Alma recruited many members from her own Acholi people and other Luo-speaking peoples. She also welcomed experienced fighters from various armies and rebel groups previously defeated by Museveni's forces. Alice later changed her last name from Alma to Laguena, which means messenger in Acholi. She was mostly known, however, just as Alice. Spiritual Armor Alice convinced many of her followers that they could wear spiritual armor to protect themselves during battle. The spiritual armor was applied with cooking oil, which followers rubbed all over their bodies. The oil, Alice claimed, was holy and made their bodies bulletproof. She also told her followers that empty bottles and stones would explode like hand grenades when thrown at their opponents. An undefined but large number of people died as a result. Many survivors soon turned to using guns in addition to wearing their spiritual armor. Remarkably, Alice, who had no formal military training, led the rebel fighters to victory on several occasions. Beginning in northern Uganda, the Holy Spirit movement moved closer and closer to Kampala until November 1987, when Alice and her followers suffered a crushing defeat near Jinja. Alice then fled to Kenya, but she was captured and imprisoned. A turbulent, turbulent time. In God's history. Let's learn about Kampala, the capital city. Located near the shore of Lake Victoria, Kampala is the capital of Uganda. Also the country's largest city, Kampala covers an area of about 70 square miles and has a population of between 1 and 1.5 million people. The city is located in a district of the same name. Uganda is divided into administrative regions called districts, and the district of Kampala is further divided into five counties, which are Kampala Central, Kawempe, Makindye, Nakawa, and Rubaga. A rich cultural heritage. Kampala is home to numerous architecturally spectacular buildings, including a Baha'i temple, the Kasubi tombs, 
the Mango Palace and the Nami Rembe Cathedral that reflect its long and colorful history. Built in 1882, the Kasubi Tombs, which house the remains of Baganda Kabakas, have been recognized by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site since 2001. First built in 1892, the Nami Rembe Cathedral has been destroyed and rebuilt four times. A heavy storm destroyed the first structure, while the second structure became unsafe from termite attacks on the building's wooden foundation. The third structure burned down after being struck by lightning. I think it's a sign by that point. Completed in 1919, the fourth structure is still standing and can seat a maximum of 1,000 people. The Baha'i Temple in Uganda is one of nine in the world and the only one in Africa. Baha'ism is a relatively new religion, and followers call their places of worship Mother Temples. The Mother Temple of Africa, which is located just outside Kampala City on Kikaya Hill, was opened in 1961. This is kind of an older book, so I wonder if there's more Baha'i temples, or at least Mother Temples, right? Kampala today. Since the fall of Idi Amin, Uganda has been taking slow but steady steps toward rebuilding a once near bankrupt economy. Nowhere in the country is the commitment to increase production and trade more apparent than in Kampala. Kampala is not only the commercial and administrative heart of Uganda, but also the country's second largest industrial and manufacturing center after Jinja. With tourism becoming a major source of income in recent years, World-class accommodations are becoming increasingly common in Kampala, where luxury hotels, pubs and nightclubs and restaurants have sprung up. Next is The Martyrs of Uganda. Really interesting story. From Mutesa I to Mwanga. Roman Catholicism reached the territory of Buganda in the late 19th century, during the reign of Kabaka Mutesa I. The first Roman Catholic missionaries that came into contact with the territory's native Bantu-speaking peoples operated under an organization called White Fathers Mission, and the missionaries began freely spreading their religion throughout the land. The next Kabaka, Kabaka Mwanga, was strongly opposed to Christianity and sought to eliminate both Roman Catholicism and Protestantism from his kingdom. In 1885, Mwanga ordered the killings of James Hannington, the killing of James Hannington, an Anglican missionary bishop, and the people who worked for him. This mass execution drew criticism and protest from Mwanga's chief steward, Joseph Mukasa, who was ultimately beheaded for his views. From servants to saints. Before he died, Mukasa protected a group of pages, or boy servants, who were learning about Roman Catholicism from another page, Dennis Sembuguawu. When Mwanga found out about these religious lessons, he ordered the capture of all the pages involved. Charles Mwanga, who succeeded Joseph Mukasa's chief steward, secretly baptized the pages one day before they set off from the village of Namugongo not far from present-day Kampala City. On the journey, two pages, Athanasius Bazu, Baze Kuketa and Gonzaga Gonza, were killed. The remaining pages were held for one week and then painfully executed. On June 3, 1886, eight pages, Achilles Kiwanuka, Adolphus Mukasa Ludigo, Ambrose Kipuka, Antal Kirigwaji, Guavira, Kiri Wamanvu, Kizito, Mugaga, and Mukasa were burned alive. One of the pages, Mbaga Tuzinde, escaped the mass execution, but was beaten to death by his father. In January 1887, another page, Jean-Marie Musei, was beheaded. Other victims. Aside from the pages, many Christians serving the Buganda Kingdom and other positions also fell victim to Mwanga's anti-Christian campaign. They included soldiers, government officials, a provincial chief, and an assistant judge. 
Noe Mawagali, a Roman Catholic leader and an unknown number of Roman Catholic and Protestant missionaries, were also murdered. And next we have the Mountains of the Moon. What a gorgeous picture. Ruinzori Mountains. The Ruinzori Mountains, also known as the Ruinzori Range, are the central feature of Ruinzori Mountains National Park, which occupies about 385 square miles in southwestern Uganda. The Ruinzori Range stretches for about 75 miles along Uganda's western border and is the tallest mountain range in Africa. In the second century, Ptolemy, a geographer, mathematician, and astronomer, saw what are thought to be the Ruinzori Mountains and called them the Mountains of the Moon. Ptolemy's name has since become an affectionate nickname for the Ruinzori Range. The Ruinzori Range consists of six main massifs, Mount Baker, Mount Emin, Mount Gesi, Mount Luigi di Savoia, Mount Speck, and Mount Stanley. The Ruinzori Mountains, unlike other snow-capped mountains on the African continent, are not volcanic. Their tops are often hidden from view by clouds. Mount Stanley and Margarita Peak At 16,795 feet, Margarita Peak, which sits atop Mount Stanley, is the highest point in both the Ruinzori Range and Uganda. Despite being part of Africa's tallest mountain range, Margarita Peak is only the third highest point on the African continent, below Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania and Mount Kenya. Africa's two tallest mountains, however, are both freestanding or independent of other mountains. Mount Kenya rises about 17,058 feet high, while Mount Kilimanjaro stands at about 19,336 feet. World Heritage. In 1994, UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, declared the Ruinzori Mountains National Park a World Heritage Site. Three years later, Ugandan rebels entered the region and began an occupation that prevented conservationists from working in the national park. In 1999, the national park was placed on UNESCO's list of World Heritage in Danger. I don't think it is now, but anyway. Next we have Namaliango College. Founded in 1902 by a group of British Roman Catholic missionaries called the Mill Hill Fathers, Namaliango College is Uganda's oldest secondary school in the course of 100 years. It's really hard trying to get this book to settle. Namalyango College began as an institution aimed at serving two purposes, to educate the sons of chiefs and to train catechists or people to teach the Christian religion. In 1906, the college became a purely academic educational institution and was renamed Sacred Heart Namalyango High School, although it was more widely known to the locals as just Namalyango High School. From 1929 to 1932, when the Brothers of Christian Instruction, also known as the Kasubi Brothers, replaced the Mill Hill Fathers in the day-to-day -day running of the school, it was known as St. Aloysius College. In the mid-1940s, enrollment at the college increased significantly after new dormitories were built, and in 1960, the school population increased again after the college expanded its curriculum to include pre-university courses. Today, Namalyango College enjoys a good reputation in Uganda for producing distinguished individuals in the fields of medicine, law, politics, and academia. So the pictures here of the school. Namalyango College today. The college accepts only top performing students at both lower and upper secondary or middle and high school levels. In Uganda, lower secondary school lasts for four years, while upper secondary school lasts for two years. Because of British colonial influence on the Ugandan education system, 
Students today receive an ordinary level at you, sorry, ordinary level certificate at the end of lower secondary school and an advanced level certificate at the end of upper secondary school. Namalyongo College is among the most advanced and progressive of Ugandan schools, with facilities, learning programs, and extracurricular activities that far exceed those of the average Ugandan secondary school. Namalyongo College, for example, was among the first three schools in the country to gain internet access for its students. The college also encourages students to participate in cross-cultural exchanges with students in other parts of the world, such as South Africa, the United States, Canada, and Russia. Next we have the National Parks and Wildlife, starting with Murchison Falls National Park. Located in northwestern Uganda, Murchison Falls National Park covers an area of about 1,482 square miles and is the country's largest national park. The namesake and highlight of the national park, Murchison Falls, is where the raging waters of the Victoria Nile are squeezed through a narrow rock opening of only about 20 feet wide before spectacularly plunging 141 feet into a pool of water below. Murchison Falls is surrounded by savannas to the north and rainforests to the south, and the National Park's diverse landscapes in turn support rich animal life, which includes buffaloes, chimpanzees, crocodiles, elephants, giraffes, hippopotamuses, lions, shoebill storks, and Ugandan cobs. Masindi, the nearest city, is about 56 miles south of the National Park. Windy Penetrable National Park. Located in far southwestern Uganda, the Windy Impenetrable National Park is characterized by intensely dense rainforests that date back to before the Ice Age. Covering an area of about 128 square miles, these ancient forests were declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 1994. Located at altitudes ranging from 3,806 feet to 8,554 feet, the Buindi Impenetrable National Park is home to about 300 mountain gorillas, about half of the world's population of the endangered species, 10 other species of primates, and about 80 more species of mammals reside in the Buindi forests, which also boast 23 native species of birds. Kabale is the city nearest to the National Park, and the Queen Elizabeth National Park. Located near the city of Kasese in southwestern Uganda, Queen Elizabeth National Park is the country's second largest national park. It covers an area of about 764 square miles. Established in 1952, Queen Elizabeth National Park is famous for astonishing biodiversity that is rivaled by few places in the world. Within the compound of the national park are diverse landscapes such as savannas, rainforests, swamps, and lakes. The park's lakes include Crater Lakes and Lake Edward. The park's different natural environments support nearly 100 different mammals and more than 600 bird species between them. It's a really stunning picture of these giraffes. I like that. Let's read about something depressing. The Rise and Fall of Idi Amin. My goodness, this book is really... I'm not wanting to cooperate. I'm doing my best. Idi Amin caused a dark period in Ugandan history that is etched in the memories of many people, both in Uganda and around the world today. A Tyrant Grows. Born in about 1925, Amin belonged to the Kakwa ethnic group that traditionally occupied northwestern Uganda. He received little education and joined the British colonial army when he turned 18. Under the British, he fought battles in Burma during World War II and in Kenya during the Mau Mau Revolt. A commendable soldier, Amin rose through the ranks and became an officer before Uganda gained independence in 1962. Few Ugandan soldiers were promoted to the rank of officer under British rule. 
After independence, Amin and Milton Obote, Uganda's first president and prime minister, became close friends. Between 1966 and 1970, Amin served as chief of the army and the air force under Obote, but increasing conflicts between the two began to divide their alliance. In January 1971, when Abote was attending a conference held in Singapore for the leaders of British Commonwealth nations, Amin seized Uganda. That same year, Amin declared himself Uganda's president and chief of its armed forces. Years of terror and decay. My goodness. Okay. Idi Amin ruled Uganda from 1971 to 1979. In 1972, he expelled Uganda's population of South Asians, who traditionally controlled much of the country's commerce. Amin then appointed trusted members of his army to run the abandoned businesses. The move ultimately left Uganda's economy in ruins. On the world stage, Amin also made some radical moves. Amin was opposed to the West, especially the British and the Americans, and was unreserved with his criticism, which worked to sour diplomatic relations. A Muslim, Amin also sought to redraw political alliances on the basis of religion. He shunned Israel and turned to openly supporting the Palestinians and Libya instead. Among Ugandans, Amin encouraged discrimination and violence between ethnic groups. Amin ordered the persecution of the Acholi and Longo peoples in particular, because he believed that they were loyal to Obote. Between 100,000 and 300,000 Ugandans were murdered during Amin's regime. It's a really good movie called The Last King of Scotland about Idi Amin. Let's read about Sime Lula Klenzi Kakungulu. If I can get the book to cooperate. Sime Lula Klenzi Kakungulu is one of Uganda's most important historical personalities. A politician and military leader who was very knowledgeable about religion, Kakungulu played an important part in the religious wars that took place in Uganda during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He was also the founder of Uganda's tiny Jewish community. Born in 1868 in Koki Kingdom to a family that had immigrated from Buganda, Kakungulu distinguished himself early in his life by becoming the chief of a district of Buganda when he was 16 years old. Kakungulu fought many wars on behalf of the king of Buganda. In 1891 and 1895, he successfully fought the Muslim armies of Arab, Ivory, and slave traders. In 1892, Kakungulu helped defeat the Catholics. He also fought the kingdoms of Bunyoro and Busoga. Kakungulu enlarged the territory of Buganda by conquering groups and tribes up to the northern border with Sudan. These important victories brought Kakungulu much power and prestige. His position was further enhanced when he married the daughter of King Mutesa I, and later the daughter of Mutesa's son. Kakungulu and the British <laughs> The British, who at this time were expanding their influence in Uganda, realized that they needed Kakungulu and his armies to help conquer territory in East Africa. When Buganda became a British protectorate in 1894, the British authorities allowed Kakungulu to continue subduing various tribes. In return for his military help, the British made Kakungulu military governor of the eastern province of Uganda. Kakungulu, however, wanted to be king of Buganda, and expected the British authorities to appoint him king because of all the military help that he had offered the British. The British, however, did not wish to appoint him king for many reasons, one of which was the fact that he was not of Buganda royal lineage. Instead, Kakungulu was made a regional chief in 1904, and put in charge of the administration of Busoga district in 1906. Kakungulu continued his efforts to get the British to appoint him king, but they refused. Kakungulu was bitterly disappointed and retired from his political and military appointments in 1913. 
Although he never ruled his country, Kakungulu was a major Uganda military figure, without whom the British would have had much difficulty extending their political and economic influence in East Africa. Next we have the women of Uganda. Traditional gender roles. Ugandan society is traditionally male-dominated. Unmarried women are taught to obey their fathers and brothers, while married women are expected to always obey their husbands. Married men are in turn expected to work outside the home to support and take care of their wives and children. In keeping with such cultural expectations, women in Uganda historically had few legal rights. Their lack of legal protection, however, has led to many Ugandan women today being saddled with more than their traditional share of household responsibilities. Rural women especially are not only homemakers and mothers, but also work tilling the family land to cultivate crops, both to eat and to sell. Furthermore, their husbands keep the money gained from the crops sold. Despite their immense workloads, few rural women can claim ownership of the land that they work on and are likely to become homeless and penniless if their marriages end in divorce or if their husbands die. Pursuing Gender Equality In the late 1980s, I'm like wrestling this book, the late 1980s, the Museveni government announced its commitment to reduce discrimination against women in the country. Adopted in 1995, Uganda's current constitution promises gender equality in the eyes of Ugandan law and in government policies. Although the Museveni government has attempted to improve the lives of Ugandan women through the 1995 constitution, the National Gender Policy, and the Ministry of Gender and Community Development, many Ugandans, both men and women, find it hard to overturn the long-standing traditions of everyday Ugandan life. The difficulties Ugandan women face in owning land, for example, remain a much debated and unresolved issue today. Many non-governmental organizations or NGOs, such as the Women of Uganda Network, or WUGNET, have been set up in response to the gross injustices that many Ugandan women face in spite of the steps taken by the Museveni government. Critics have pointed out that the government's gender policies are good in theory, but have no real effect on most women's lives. This book can't wait to turn the page. There we go. Lastly, we're going to read about a wondrous house, the Kissingiri home. First of all, here's the house. The house itself. Located in Mengo, Kampala, the legendary Kissingiri house was built on a three-acre plot of land in the late 19th century. The house has as many as 70 rooms, which are spread over three stories. The walls of the house were built from dried mud, bricks, and stone, while the flooring, staircases, windows, and doors were made from wood. Dominating the interior of the house are two enormous rooms, each of which is reputedly large enough in itself to accommodate a modest house. Some of these smaller rooms measure 20 feet long by 20 feet wide. Also inside the house is a 20-foot long swimming pool. Over the years, parts of the house were renovated, in order to provide the interior of the house with electricity and running water, as well as bathtubs, sinks, and toilets. Today, the outside of the Kissingiri house is blue. Apart from the rusty metal sheets that form the sloping, multi-tiered roof, the house is said to be in excellent condition despite being over 100 years old. In fact, some observers have gone as far as to say that not a single crack can be found in the structure. The old-fashioned architectural style of the building is probably the only sign of its age. The History of the House Construction for the Kissingiri House was ordered by Zakaria Kizito Kissingiri, who was one of three regents, or royal advisors, to young Kabaka Daudi Chua II. Chua II was a child when he succeeded his father, Kabaka Mwanga, who was forced out of power by the British. 
because of his privileged position, Kissingiri was able to afford a large and luxurious home. In 1917, Zakaria Kissingiri died, and his son Stanley took over as head of the household. Stanley Kissingiri married Beatrice Mugale, a stepsister of Kabaka Mutesa II. Although Stanley died in 1991, Beatrice continues to live in the Kissingiri house with their children and grandchildren. For a brief period of time, while Stanley was still studying overseas, the Kissingiri house functioned as a gombolola, or county court. Look at this turtle. It's, let's see, they have tortoises sprawling the front lawn. Interesting. They are brought from the Seychelles. Very cool. Okay. <laughs> That's going to be it for tonight. To let this book relax. It's really intense. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night.